Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you could all join us for this intellectual shamans conversation um, on faculty development with Tima Bansal. Um, Michael, if you just say a couple words about um, uh, the International Humanistic Management Association first, and then we'll get going. So yeah, well, thank you, Sandra. Uh, thank you, Tima, for being here. And uh, the International Humanistic Management Association is a group that tries to uh, promote and professionalize this space that we call humanistic management. It's a, what we consider a different paradigm of looking at organizing practices. And organizing is seen as a wide sort of spectrum. We can organize pretty much any type of interaction. <clears throat> and uh, because we think that we can do better than we are currently doing, we, we think that there are two principles that are core to it, the protection of dignity and the promotion of well-being. And uh, you'll hear from Tima today in some way how she might be unwittingly using these kind of principles in some way to, to organize her research and her practice and, and her teaching. So I want to just uh, thank everybody for being on and also just thank Sandra and, and Tima for, for doing this. So I'll mute myself. Thank you. Okay, so let me just introduce Timo before we begin. Um, so some of you may know I wrote a book a few years back called, the, called Intellectual Shamans, and Timo was one of the first people I thought of to put in that book because of her remarkable career. She's currently professor of strategy at the Ivy Business School, Western University in Canada. She's also director of the Ivy Center on Building Sustainable Value and the executive director and founder of the Network for Business Sustainability, which has more than 5,000 researchers and managers um, interacting from around the world and all committed to advancing sustainable business. Um, she's an amazingly prolific scholar. She publishes, publishes consistently in top tier management journals and serves now as deputy editor of the Academy of Management Journal, having been AE for many years. She's received, received numerous recognitions of her scholarship, including the prestigious Canada Research Chair in 2012 and the ONE Distinguished Scholar Award in 2017. And she received a 2008 Faculty Pioneer Award for academic leadership from the Aspen Institute. Her work targets the interplay between business strategy and sustainability. She forges new links between theory and practice through many aspects of her work, attempting to bring issues of sustainability right into business practice. Her pioneering research emphasizes studying the implications of different time horizons at individual and organizational levels, how businesses can engage with paradox, innovations in sustainability, and organizational resilience, most often in the context of sustainability. Tima works with doctoral students and many collaborators, including junior scholars, is an innovator in teaching with colleagues in her editorial capacities and with business leaders in the Network for Business Sustainability. Um, among other things, she's introduced sustainability tracks in the PhD and MBA programs at Ivy and speaks and presents often at conferences and universities. Uh, in all respects, she's one of the most accomplished scholars that we have, and um, I'm tired just thinking about all the things she's done here. So, so Tima, um, let's turn it over to you. You've accomplished so much in so many different arenas, including founding and directing the Network for Business Sustainability, your editorial responsibilities, your mentoring, and not least your rather incredible publication record. Can you tell us how you balance all of these things and still produce at such a high level so consistently? over quite a long period of time. And remembering that the point of this, these conversations is to help others achieve the kinds of things that you've achieved. Um, so, uh, Sandra, thank you, first of all, for that amazing introduction. And, and I know that you just didn't read the website, so I do appreciate the, the work that you did to, to pull that together. And to uh, Michael and Erica and Doug and David to invite me to this, I really, really, really honored. Um, and your question about how do I balance all that? Uh, I think that I'm not sure I see this as balanced. I, in fact, I always, often feel unbalanced, but I think that uh, there was a day when I didn't have gray hair. And now that I do, I think that in retrospect, it feels like I've done a lot. But at that moment that I'm doing things, it always feels so incomplete as it does now. So it's like one of those things where you take stock and then you, you say, wow, you know, maybe I have done a few things. Um, but at any point along that process, I always feel inadequate. Um, you know, and a, a, a really cool uh, saying, Kierkegaard says that life can only be uh, understood looking backwards, but life must be experienced looking forwards. I didn't know 
that this is where I'd be. Sandra, I, I just ended up here, but, and I don't know if I even had a destination, but I definitely had a purpose. Does that answer your question? I can, I can go yeah, on. Well, maybe you could explore your purpose a little bit. That would be helpful. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, you know, sustainability came to me more by chance than by design. And I think that there's other people that are probably more designed, you know, that they know what they want to do. But I grew up in Canada. Those of you who are on the line just a little bit earlier, I show you my world. And this is, uh, I'm very Canadian. And I was a weekend environmentalist. I didn't really think much about uh, uh, the environment. I think I took it for granted. And then when I did my doctoral work, having had an economics background, there is an opportunity to think about those puzzles that challenge economics and environmental responsibility was one of those challenges. And so I thought this is kind of an interesting intellectual puzzle. And then as the intellectual puzzle became much more interesting to me, I pursued it. And what became a weekend vocation became my weekday preoccupation. I just, this is what I wanted to do. And and I've become almost obsessed with sustainability issues, so they become heart and soul for me. So I, I am very sympathetic to people in their earlier stages of their career not knowing, but at some point, at some turning point, I knew that this is who I was and what I wanted to do. And I think I was one of the earlier scholars, there's some earlier ones from, uh, from me even, but that had the identity of sustainability, not organizational theory, not strategy, not international business. It was sustainability. And that was purpose because I do think that this is the issue that's, that businesses, all businesses should be thinking about. So very driven by the topic and purpose. So you said you started out in economics, of course, I knew that. Um, and um, sustainability is sort of a far cry from economics as we know it. So what kinds of dynamics, relationships, experiences might have pushed you towards um, doing sustainability research, particularly in the area of strategy, which I think still hasn't really adopted issues of sustainability very much? Well, yeah, you know, uh, so I started my work in the early 1990s and the WCED coined the term sustainable development in 1987. So at the beginning, I didn't even know what sustainable development was. And then it was only, um, it was only over time that I really started to wear it and know it and understand it. And I think I'm still start, still learning, but all along, I think that sustainable development has been the challenge to neoliberal economics and so and and as you know strategy is based on neoliberal economics so the beauty of it is that a beauty of sustainability is that it's a it's an ethic it's a destination it's a journey that no one can dispute and yet it is at the it challenges the heart of neoliberal thinking which is a dominant paradigm and so once you start to realize that's an ethic that no one disputes and it challenges the way that we do things, the world opens up to you as an academic because almost everything in the world as it's being run today by organizations, uh, and it is at, I, I take it at the organizational level of analysis or maybe even more macro than that, um, everything is being challenged by the sustainability paradigm. And there is just so much rich opportunity for the intellectual uh, um, endeavor. More than that though, there's a practice-based imperative that we do something. And I think that that has made me even more driven to do something important in our world. So yeah, um, anyway, uh, maybe I've drifted a bit, but. No, I think that's important. Um, could you talk about NBS a little bit, the Network for Business Sustainability? And before we go on, I just want to remind um, our listeners that you can put comments or questions for Tima into the chat box and, and we'll come back to those in a little bit. So, um, so um, you know, you founded NBS. That's not something that everyone thinks to do. It's got now 5,000. Um, Actually, members. more. I think we're closer to 7,000 to 10,000. And so, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a, pretty, that's pretty remarkable. And it, and it really speaks to this theory practice divide that we all think about and speak about and hear about. And, and yet, here you are, this really accomplished scholar actually bridging that divide in some ways. Um, so t talk a little bit about NBS and the motivation for doing it and what you've learned from it. You know, I, I'm going to go back to what I just said earlier. I don't know if a lot of what I do is planned and uh, it's, it's very purpose driven, but there's some bit of tripping into whatever I do. Um, I wrote an article for the Academy of Management Perspectives with four co-authors and we had within the article a dialogue and in my dialogue piece, I said, if I had known how much work it was to start and operate and run NBS, I may not have done it. But now that I am where I am, I'm glad I've done it. Uh, and so how did I start though, the, the story? I think everybody likes to hear the stories, but um, it's tenure, uh, it's about tenure at that time. And I think I had a degree of frustration that I think a lot of junior scholars, maybe even senior scholars confront that we work really hard on our research, years for my research to get to be published. And yet, really, no one reads it. Yet, I do think it's important, um, my work, but a lot of work. And so I think it, uh, NBS was born out of the frustration of all that work, not having much voice in, in practice, not being heard in practice. And so, um, and I, I have this wonderful context of being uh, in Canada. So there's government money um, and being at a business school that valued sustainability. So I will always say to anybody working in the field that you feel like you're in the margin, get to a place that values what you do because it makes a huge amount of difference when your colleagues look at you as being uh, sensible as opposed to being marginal. Um, so, I got some government money at this point of feeling frustration and it was only $25,000. Um, and what I used for that, what I used the money for was to see if there is a way of mobilizing academics in this space so that we can work together to have more voice. The 25,000 then led to another $25,000 grant. And that made it clear to me that what we needed to do was to work with um, managers more directly. So I collected my first 15, managers of the most um, uh, progressive organizations in Canada. And, uh, and then we, as a managerial community, the academic community, started some of that dialogue. And from that, I put forward a big grant application that was $2.1 million. And then I did this again, and I got $2.5 million. And all of this is to bridge that research practice divide. So, it's the incremental first step that led to a bigger step that led to bigger leaps that that led me to where I am now. You know, I love your framing of um, you, you sort of do one thing at a time and then look back. That's one I've often used myself. It's like, yeah, maybe there is a body of work there after a while. Um, and it, yeah, but it yeah, is a matter of here, Sandra. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but yeah, but it is. Yeah, it, it, it's sort of a matter of doing one thing and doing the next thing and keeping keeping doing stuff, even if you're following sort of synchronistically um, what makes sense to you at that time or opportunistically even. Um, what are the biggest lessons from working with NBS that you've had? Uh, well, I there's personal lessons as well as impacting practice type lessons. Um, let me tell you about my personal lesson first. I think the hardest thing about it is how fragmented I feel. Um, and so I feel like I have different lives. You talked about my editorial life, what I do at AMJ. Uh, and I don't think anybody at AMJ knows about MBS. Um, and then you can talk about my research life and what I do with my students and everybody else in terms of research. And I give research talks and they don't know about NBS. And so it's like I have multiple lives that I not only fragmented, but that to have, to be heard in those various communities is very difficult because it's like each one takes a slice of you. And, and uh, you can't give your whole self 
So you always feel a little bit inadequate. So I think that that's been the hardest personal struggle. It's always feeling a little bit inadequate. And I think the place that I feel the most inadequate is having voice with managers. And so I think I have voice with some managers and I've seen, but not seen nearly as much as I think. And, and am I willing to jump with both feet into the managerial world? I'm not even sure if I want to yet. Um, on the, uh, more on the managing a network side of things, and what have I learned from that? I think that the, on the positive note, I am absolutely reassured by how many thoughtful managers there are that are committed to sustainability and really want to interact with the academic space. And so they don't know how, they don't even know where to go. And so I think that NBS gives them that opportunity. So that's on the positive side. On the more challenging side, I think, the limited attention of managers and the speed at which everything moves is a nut that I haven't cracked. Um, so to get managers to engage for more than a year, well, it used to be I could get them to engage for two or five or eight years. Now I'm having difficulty for even one year. And um, so managers come and go, and then they read an article and they'll only read a piece of it and it just feels like the landscape is changing faster than I can change with it. So that's the biggest one. Uh, you're, so I'm, I'm, I'm muting, I muted myself there. Um, so one of the things you're talking about here is this translation function. And there's been um, a lot of talk lately about how we bridge between theory and practice. And one of the things that, that as academics we need to learn to do is to translate our research into terms that um, managers can understand if we hope to have any impact on them. Because they're not going to read, they're not frankly going to read an AMJ article for the most part. Um, so how do, how do you think about that and, and how do you do that with respect to uh, the managers you're interacting with? Um. So translation is an interesting concept because that was where I started was this was a translation problem and it's not entirely a language problem. In fact, one could argue that's even the questions problem that we're asking very different questions the managers want to have answered. And so if we are asking that how or why, which is often what intrigues us because it's a how or why that will help us um, predict or prescribe changes, then managers want to just know, tell me what to do next. And so they have very practice driven orientation. And so, which is very context specific. We want to generalize beyond our context. That's what theory really is. Whereas managers want to be very context embedded. And so I don't think it's a translation problem. But then it's not entirely a questions problem. There are we asking the wrong questions. It's also that the answers that we look for tend to be fairly abstract as well. And I, I've realized that the issue with managers is that they might want a systematic review of the literature, but a systematic review of the literature doesn't really work either because that's the answers because in the micro world it does. If you want to know what is the best employee compensation scheme, that will work because it's micro. But if you're looking at the macro piece around business strategy and sustainability, systematic reviews only get us so far. They don't get us very far at all. Where I am now um, on this, Sandra, is that I believe that we need to work in real time with real managers and to amplify that real work in real time. So that co-creation work. So we're building knowledge with them as opposed to for them. And when we build knowledge with them, the knowledge becomes more relevant. While at the same time, we can retain our rigor if we're careful. But not only that, if we can amplify that knowledge while we're co-creating it with them, then it can be relevant to other managers as well. And so that's where NBS is going right now is in that co-creation process. And, Grima Sharma is really taking a big lead in that um, so that we hope that we can start to change at least some of the practices of our academy as well.
Wow, I think that's really important. Of course, it fits right in with the responsible research and manage business and management exactly. uh, initiative yeah. that Ansu and others have um, initiated, and that I think is really hoping. I'm hoping really gain some control. It takes a lot more time to do that co-creative work. Um, so, uh, what would you say to more junior scholars who are ah, I have to get into AMJ. <laughs> I need my impact factor or whatever. Yeah, uh, you know, I think about that a lot, obviously. Uh, um, I'm going to once again tell you the good news, challenging news story. But the good news story is we are so ready for good research that is relevant to the world of practice, but theoretically deep. Um, and I, I think that we're starved as um, academics that are running these journals and the editorial processes. I know not all editorial processes are that easy, but I can say for myself, when I get an article that's well done, uh, that's written well, that has an interesting question, and that shows deep understanding of the phenomena and pushes the intellectual boundaries, that article is likely going to at least get the first revision process right so so we're hungry for that and i think it's a hunger that i don't think has been there before so we saw um of course there's a new ways of seeing amj special issue that we're working through right now that will be published i, I think at the end of 2019 or beginning of 220 um but we had amr that looked for new theorizing i think uh there's another one in the journal of management or management studies that's also calling for new new theorizing so i think that there's this deep, deep hunger for the type of work that our collective divisions do in this uh, humanistic social responsibility, sustainability space, and that we can offer. So that's on the positive news side. Yeah, some of that, oh, yeah, go ahead. Please. No, please. Go ahead. No, no, challenges, that would be. Uh, the challenge is, is that I think that it's really hard to do this away uh, on your own, uh, away from the phenomena you have to be deeply embedded in the phenomenon because if we're gonna challenge the existing paradigm, we have to know what we're seeing. And so that takes time. And so the commitment to do good work, to push boundaries is truly, truly hard and takes a little bit of courage or maybe a lot of courage and the willingness to fail yet persist. Well, that's what the intellectual shamans that I studied all did where they took risks and they had the courage to follow their own hearts, not just to do what everybody expects them to do. Because there's a lot of expectations today about impact factors and citation counts and all of these things and, you know, sort of sticking with the line. And, um, you know, one of the things that gets triggered when I think about the kind of work you're talking about is that it, and it's, it's related to some stuff that I'm now doing, it's inherently interdisciplinary. If we really hope to understand things in new ways. We have to cross different kinds of boundaries. And of course, connecting is one of the functions of the intellectual shaman as well, across those different types of boundaries. Um, that means, I guess, understanding the language of maybe natural scientists or, um, you know, human, human, humanities folks or artists, you know, people that are very, very different from management scholars. Um, and, and also, creates a situation in which you have many authors of a paper. So have you, I don't know if you've run across that at this point, um, but um, if you have, how would you respond to those ideas? Having many authors that cut through disciplines? Absolutely. <laughs> That's, Sandra, you hit the nail on the head that this is how we're gonna move the world forward. I don't care about the journals, but I think that if we are really going to solve these big world problems, wicked problems, we need to have, um, we need to have transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary work. You know, yeah, my recent, sorry, go on. Go ahead. No, that, I was gonna say that Business and Society Journal just published an editorial on doing good interdisciplinary work. Um, and so there is some thinking going on about the need to do this, but I don't think they understand. I've seen papers in the sciences where there are literally 30 authors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen that, <laughs> but I have to admit that I'm on a California Management Review article. And I think there's 14 of us. Oh, well, that's and pretty good. Was the outcome of a, of a symposium that we held, um, and so it was believed to be a joint conversation. 
um, I'm just checking the time here. So we'll do, uh, so um, yeah, one of the questions I had written down was it's not easy to take the kinds of risks that you've taken, both intellectually and academically, and in founding NBS. Um, you know, where did you find the strength inside to do that? Or did, was it almost accidental in some ways? Yeah, uh, you know, I don't know if I see myself having taken risks. I don't know if that's how I see the world. Um, I think I just see it with conviction. And so it's not that I ever thought about what if I fail? I just couldn't imagine doing anything else, you know, and I'll put my hand up in meetings even before I was tenured because I had conviction about something. And to me, that conviction has allowed me to step outside of the intellectual boundaries and to challenge what we know. And the people that most stimulate me are the people who stand up to what I think and say, here's a different way of understanding what we know and do it respectfully, of course. But I think that's the only way that we're gonna progress is if we challenge things, but it's not through risks, it's through true conviction. You know, I just wanna say one thing about the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary work that I've thought about is, there's uh, ways that you can think about the differences of paradigms, but there's ways in which we can also find similarities, threads that cut across paradigms. Um, and my work on, I do work, as she said, the introduction, in the introduction on time. Time is an issue that's relatable to the natural sciences, the human sciences, the social sciences, everything has some aspect of time to it. And so it brings people together when you talk about time. I also think about space and scale. So time, space, and scale. And then I moved into resilience. And I realized that resilience applies to engineering, to public health, to children, to one's personal health, to organizations. And so resilience is also one of those conversations that can allow us to move the world towards sustainability, but bring transdisciplinarity into the room. So I don't think it's, it's about finding those threads that cut across the disciplines that allows for some of that transdisciplinary work to flourish. Um, and one more question before we turn it over to um, our participants. Um, um, what advice would you give to younger scholars or new, newer scholars these days? Um, so, you know, I, I, I admit that I'm idealist. I, I'm an idealist. I, I believe that we should be saving the world and we have this opportunity uh, because of the profession that we have. Uh, we, there is no other profession that I know where people can pursue their own intellectual endeavors, do what they want during their day job that has meaning and not, you know, they might be worried about losing uh, not getting through tenure, but the reality is if you do something important, you probably will get through tenure. So I think the advice I have is to do something important. And the story I sometimes tell, and I don't know why this one hung on to me, but Spotlight, the film that won the Academy Best Picture Award, I think for the Academy Awards in 2015 or so, was Spotlight is investigative journalism in the Boston Globe. And they opened up a vast amount of pedophilia um, among Catholic priests in Boston. And it was only done by a little nugget of an insight that someone said that there was possibly a cover up of one pedophile. When they realized that it was actually 6% or something of priests that were involved in this, it was just horrific. But it, it required a persistence and a willingness to really understand for them. We have lost, in many ways, this deep, long-form journalism. And what we are now is more than journalists, but what we are are the canaries in the coal mines. We have the ability and the obligation, are really the responsibility, to do something of importance to the world. What do I, advice do I give to junior scholars, but to any scholar, is that we have to be the spotlights. We have to offer the opportunity for others to follow us and see the, see what can be, what should be, and what may happen if we don't do things right. So 
that's one piece I would say of advice. Do, do what's important, even if you don't necessarily know where it's going to lead, because it will lead to something important. And the second one is too many scholars get caught up in perfection and aiming uh, to just put their time in. More than anything, I think we need to get stuff out. So always focus on the outputs. Work serially. Don't work in parallel. Get things done. Don't just start things. So those are the two pieces of advice. And you're muted. Is Ju Young Park still on? Ju Young? Yes, I'm here. Yes, you have a question for Tima. You want to ask it? Uh, basically, the question that I had in my mind was like the question that you just asked. So um, that, that oh. was a good answer for me. And um, I think I know a little better uh, what I should do. My, my problem was like always having like too much, too many projects at the same time and like make, not making enough progress on any of them. So I think working serially instead of like simultaneously, I think that that is a good advice for me. Okay, great. And, Ju Young, if I could just add to that, I think that um, it's even more important now when, uh, when I was younger, a junior scholar, we used to mail in our manuscripts and have three copy, five copies that we would send in and nine months later we would get the paper back. And now, uh, you know, we're sending in reviews back decisions within two months at AMJ. And so you don't have the time to have multiple projects. And the people that I see really successful in our field are the people that just work on a couple of projects at one time and just rotate between them and get them mm -hmm. finished before they move to the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's good advice. Thank you. Um, and Ravi Chinta, are you here still? Ravi? You had a fairly long question about the principles of humanistic management. They're clear enough, but how to apply these principles and put them into action. Um, you need to define the system's boundaries so as to be focused in an application. Um, Ravi, are you here? Yes, I am here. Yeah. You want to articulate the rest of your question? Uh, the rest of the questions are uh, pretty straightforward, meaning we all embrace the gen general principles of humanistic management, you know, the integrity, uh, ecological conservatism, being kind and all that stuff. And they're so powerful and um, so convincing, we all embrace them. However, when it comes to implementing them, you have to be very clear on what the system boundaries are, because what's... Uh, 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 humanistic management uh, is for one system is not the same as when you apply it for a different system. So talking about these uh, abstract prin uh, principles, which everybody agrees on, without uh, a clear definition of the system to which they are applied, uh, it becomes more inane or empty uh, and doesn't lead us to real, you know, you, you talked about bridging. So that's what I was getting to. For example, resilience. Uh, yeah, re resilience at the firm level is very different from resilience at the ecological level. Uh, and uh, at the firm level, we relate it to dynamic capabilities. And in my comment, I gave a definition from uh, University of Toronto professor. Uh, so all I'm saying is when you apply the principles uh, to one system, uh, they, they take on a very substantive meaning, but when you try to apply the same thing to a different system, they take on a different uh, translation. Uh, and it's a deep philosophical question, Ravi, that you've raised, um, and one that uh, we'd love to discuss, I'd love to discuss offline. I do think that concepts differ by levels of analysis or scale. So you're absolutely right. But I do think that as well, there's lots of learning or some principles, let's say, that uh, allows resilience concepts to move across scales. And so if resilience is adaptability or resilience is the ability to return from shocks, then I think 
we can think deeply about either adaptability or what gives organizations the ability to recover from shocks. And though that, whether it's organizations or individuals or certain, or, or societies or cities or whatever, uh, there are certain principles that can apply. And it's those principles then that we as intellectuals can, um, can deepen and then apply to very specific situations. And that's when we have to morph it to that level of analysis that's important. You know, one of the big ones with resilience, I just read about this briefly this morning, but it's diversity. And we know that diversity builds resilience. So if we have too much monoculture, whatever it might be, then we know that a system is open to plague or, or of, uh, um, disturbances of any sort. Right now, we know that biodiversity has been compromised significantly. It's one of the planetary boundaries that's most at risk. Nobody really talks about biodiversity as a lack of resilience until a UN report just came out, I think, yesterday that spoke to resilience and biodiversity. So I think that we could have been much more foresightful about this because we understood diversity and its importance to resilience. Many decades ago right so I do think that we have opportunities to inform systems even though they differ at different levels of analysis I mean it, it strikes me that um, what we're talking about is really a need for a massive system change and not 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 in the long term in the relatively short term and to the extent that we consider continue doing uh, what Bill Frederick once called same old, same old research. So in the CSR field, it's, you know, more CSP, financial performance stuff, you know, and I know I'm one of the authors that did that, but it's time to go on to something new and much more, uh, much bigger. We need to think about how we tackle the kinds of bigger questions that you seem to be tackling, sustainability, um, paradox, uh, the time question, how people's time frames affect things. Um, and that's, it's, that seems like a real challenge for young, more new, newer scholars, but how, how do you begin to think about doing research on one of these sort of really big system change types of topics? I don't know what the answer is to that, Sandra. I, I do have the privilege of years and years of thought about this. And what I do is take a single thread um, of insight. So, uh, you know, I, with Mark Desjardins, we looked at the recovery of stock markets. Uh, so what time, type of firm is more likely to recover from a stock market shock? So this is a global environmental crisis and, sorry, the global financial crisis. And, and so then that provides us the empirical context to look at something that's practically important because businesses want to know, but then it's also analytically rich because we can embed that in the resilience literature. Um, so I think that as I pursue research questions, I start with a narrow slice of insight that allows me to open up the deeper, richer theoretical insights. And I feel like over time, what I've been able to do is a shotgun approach. So this ability to, um, uh, see a lot of the landscape, even though each study only shows me a tiny piece of it. Right, it's that kind of building on what you've done in the past. Um, Tatiana, are you still here? Because I think your question really follows nicely with uh, what Tima just said. Tatiana? No? Tatiana asked, what are some of the most important research questions today that scholars might want to think about starting to do research on? I don't know if you have oh, any insight on that, but that's, uh, that's a... <laughs> you know, uh, first of all, what we do at MBS is um, talk to some of the managers. So we did this, I think about two or three months ago. We did focus groups with people at GE. We included both academics and managers in the same focus groups um, to talk about what they think is on their mind. So we've posted it on the NBS website and I can certainly let people know about that after we're offline. Um, but what do I think managers care about right now? Uh, hmm, you know, that's interesting. Uh, what do I think they care about versus what do I think they should care about? 
And I feel like we as academics should be one step ahead of them. And I do think that there is this lag in managerial thinking because they're just like so focused on the next day. So what do I think they th should care about? I think one is the circular economy is huge now. And if I think about what sustainability looks like as a destination, it looks like the circular economy that uses only renewable energy because you can basically create these industrial processes that only use renewable energy. They're aligned then with the um, natural systems as well. And so I would be studying stuff to do with the circular economy. So that's supply chains, that's collaboration, that's innovation. Um, I would be studying stuff like, uh, um, I really think systems are important. And so this is, we have such linear reductivist thinking, arguably in a lot of our theories that we have. I think much more insight using a systems approach is helpful. And we started seeing systems articles. I remember um, Donda Plowman's article. She was the first author of like five or six authors published an AMJ article. And I would like to say it's about 2007. I don't know. Uh, it won the best paper award. It was basically complexity thinking. Or as uh, Ravi was talking about, dynamic capabilities is another area that I think really takes strategy and sustainability and combines them. And uh, we've had... Kathleen Eisenhart writing about dynamic capabilities, even though she's not a sustainability person, those themes still very much apply. And I know that Brent McKnight, one of my former students, uh, was trying to unpack dynamic capabilities in the context of sustainability. So I think there's lots of room for growth here or for research. Um, Lewis, are you still here? You had a question about leadership? Maybe not. Um, Lewis's question is, there's not much out there on leadership for sustainability. What do you see as the greatest challenge in this regard and your role in it? Oh, I don't know what you mean by leadership for sustainability. Uh, so I'm afraid, Lewis, you'd have to, you have to give me more context. I don't know if you mean the topic area of leadership or you mean how do we lead positive change in sustainability? Hello? Lewis, ah, there he is. Yeah, this hi. is Jody Fry. My uh, formal name is Lewis, and I'm oh, on my Jody, iPhone, hi. so <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Well, I, I use the word leadership for sustainability instead of responsible leadership or sustainability leadership or conscious leadership. And uh, I'm program director of our recently launched One Planet Leadership Program, and uh, I'll send you, uh, I just found you. I, I'm sorry for my ignorance, uh, but I'll certainly send you there. We have an upcoming uh, conference called Sustainable Sustex, and I'll send you information on that. So, and I've been working in the area of leadership for a lot of years, and and I've kind of, you know, I really relate with your purpose and your passion and the urgency of this, and of course my focus is we can do all this, but how do we train the leaders at all the levels so that this, it can get done? And so I just wanted your thoughts on that. Wow, uh, it was Jody, right? Is that what you said? Yes, yeah, yeah. Jody. Sorry about Jody. that. Um, the, the handle on your phone shows up as Lewis. So um, yeah. the, I don't know the answer. Uh, and it's one in which I've struggled because if you take a systems perspective, then one doesn't necessarily believe that leadership is what will drive responsibility or sustainability necessarily. Sustainability is probably more so than responsibility. So if you take a systems approach, then the change is often emergent. It can happen at mid levels of management. It can even happen with one individual that's lower in the organization if you look at complex systems. And leadership, top down leadership can actually cause some problems as well, right? So if you, if you, it can move the, move an organization or a system in the wrong direction. And so, you know, where I, where I feel one of my next frontiers is, Jody, and I, I, you know, this is something actively pursuing, is trying to understand how to embed systems thinking into leadership. And so I think that just saying that we need leaders that do good things or are responsible or 
think about the natural environment. I'm not sure is the answer, but the leaders I do think are really good in terms of sustainability also understand systems. So Paul Pullman is always our go-to guy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, as a former, I think he's former now, uh, CEO of Unilever. He, um, he thinks in systems. He can just read everything that he writes and the videos that he has. And you, can, uh, and you can just see that he understands that there's, whenever there's an action, there's a reaction. And Unilever is a big player. So the actions that they create have reverberations throughout the system. That sort of mindset is what I'd love to teach our business students yeah well our approach is more not top down it's by by and large we're all leaders for sustainability and this uh the system is important and in fact uh i think you touched on it earlier about you know the ultimate system controller is the neoliberal paradigm until we have more of a what we call it's work i'm doing now on what i call or we call a neo-humanistic paradigm then it that will create the context for the systems and the leadership where this change can really happen. So that's sort of our approach in our program. So couldn't agree with you more. Thanks for Thank sharing, Jody. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Jody. The, uh, the changing the narrative is really important and it's certainly an area of research that could use a lot of attention in addition to uh, the kinds of things that uh, Tim has been talking about. Um, Gina, are you still there? Gina Wittenberg? You had several questions. Gina? Okay, I'm unmuted. Yes, absolutely. Uh, great. Uh, just uh, in response to the last question, Jody's question, I just wanted to let everybody know um, that I have a whole chapter on leadership for sustainability in my uh, book, the Sustainable Enterprise Field Book, and a lot of resources online, not to be self-serving, but um, I have a lot of thoughts on that. And it's all based on systems thinking, paradox, and, and uh, incorporating leadership at every level. The questions that I was uh, asking uh, tie to um, the whole field of co-creating and action research. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are aware, but for 10 years we did at the Academy of Management, uh, we had a community called the Sustainability Practice Action Research Community. And uh, we would bring in uh, managers and executives from various companies and have tables where the scholars that were interested in uh, helping them would co-create and design action research projects, which would then be executed. And many positive things came out of it. For example, um, a multi-million dollar NSF grant to help the Veterans Administration reduce stress, just as one example. I would love to recreate that because it was very successful. It was done in like a day and um, at the Academy. And um, I think it's a really great model. And what that leads to is uh, my question, because fundamentally, don't you think we need to change the tenure system uh, to reward action research and more practice oriented research? Because why would people be doing it if they're not rewarded for that? And um, as a former executive coming into academia, it's shocking how little real research is valued. And so I wanted your thoughts on that. Sorry for the long question. <laughs> no, and I appreciate the insights that you gave of your own work and, um, and even appreciate the service that you've done for the academy and through your book and all. The um, I, action research is really important. There's no question about it. And as a deputy handling qualitative research at AMJ, uh, we have been strong proponents of action research. We're starting to see it trickle in. The difficulty is a lot of action research is not done well. So it's not that we don't want to publish it, but it still has to meet some criteria of goodness, of goodness of quality. I would argue that any researcher, qualitative researcher that goes to the field and collects data as a participant observer of any sort has changed, or a participant interviewer, has changed the context. As soon as they change the context, in some ways, they have some degree of action, right? And so what we have done, I think, as a scholarly community is, is blinded, blinkered ourselves to the fact that we've been doing this thing called action research, but calling it something else. So let's figure out what we're doing and recognize there's different scales of it. And if you are a participant observer, and truly involved in the activity, then you need to make that, that very clear and 
the research process. If you make it clear in the methods section and also illustrate yourself in the data section, but then theorize in a way that shows a contribution to the field, I don't think it's a problem to do action research. And I think that the time has changed. I think that you are absolutely right that there's a uphill push, but right now, the, I, I, certainly AMJ um, is really open to it. Thank you. I just want to add, Gina, um, Hillary Bradbury, who's a well-known action research scholar, is holding a meeting with the SDG Transformations Forum in Chalmers, where is it, Finland maybe, Norway, hmm. um, Sweden, um, in March. And it's bringing together 100 action researchers to try to push the idea of doing good action research. So that might be something to, to I'll, link, I'll link to uh, the website for AR Plus so that um, um, we can think about it. Maureen, are you still here? Thank you. Maureen? Uh, Maureen's question is about talking about co-creating sustainability knowledge with, with managers and then spreading it to managers. Um, she asks, are we talking about publishing case studies? Um, um, I, I throw that question at you. Uh, okay, so, so is it Maureen? There you are. Yeah. Oh, so, so you can hear me. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, my, my question was actually answered by this post from, I don't know who this is, M. Fishoff, uh, the, the link to uh, quite a bit of articles on, on action research. So uh, never mind my question. <laughs> and uh, Maureen, just so you know, Maya Fishoff is, uh, works with the Network for Business Sustainability. So I didn't know that she was online, but it's wonderful. And she and Garima Sharma have created a whole host of resources on co-creating uh, knowledge with managers, as well as action research. Thank you. Uh, Joe yes, Gladstone, you, um, are you? And I, I certainly don't want to be, it is about me, but I am also uncomfortable about this, but um, Grima and I just had a paper accepted at the Academy of Management Journal on co-creating knowledge. And so it just goes to show that you can publish in the good journals. And just so you know, being a deputy does not give me any favor. I have had so many rejections at AMJ, but this is one article that did get through. So co-creating knowledge, action research is very publishable in our good journals. Uh, Joe Gladstone, you had a question. Did you want to ask it? Joe, you still here? Um, Joe's question is about um, teaching leaders to think in systems. How, how do we move that forward? So uh, it's a really great question and one that I've been contemplating um, a couple of things. One is that MIT has a systems orientation to their sustainability group and they create what they call management flight simulators. And so uh, I'm going to give you the example, but when you are playing sport, let's say baseball, and you're trying to catch a ball, you are actually thinking in systems in real time, right? The catching of the ball means that you have to work through a number of variables, but you don't calculate those variables. You actually just intuit them. And that's sort of like dynamic capabilities. And so they are creating uh, simulations that allow managers to understand the set of variables that work into an equation. And those variables can be at the organizational level, at the macro level, at the individual level, but all of those have an action reaction element to them. So these management flight simulators, I think is one way to do it is through simulation. And as soon as managers start to realize that they don't have complete control over what they do is one way. Also, um, Meadows, this is Meadows and Meadows, uh, and I Donella don't Meadows, Donella Meadows, leverage Don points for change. Donella. Yeah. Um, she has, is it she, he, sorry, she, 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 she has a book on systems, teaching and systems. 
and and some really basic exercises on how to do that. And I'm just going to give you one though that I like. Um, recognize that we only have a couple of minutes, but put eight people into a group. Ask them to look at two other people, and be equidistant to those two people. Not say out loud who those two people are. You will find that they start to move in the system. They will eventually reach some sort of homeostasis. Move one person, and then they have to reorganize, and that teaches students systems thinking so quickly in a way. And what we need to do then is to help them understand how systems work and then move them into resolutions of actually changing systems. And I think that we can do that, but we have to be brave in taking the paradigm that we currently have of teaching and shifting it to something that allows us to be more simulations oriented so people intuit what a system is and don't have to necessarily analyze it. Donella, thanks, Sandra. Donella Meadows. Donella Meadows, yeah, she has, I just put a link to one of her important articles in the uh, chat room. It's called Leverage Points for Change, her places to in intervene in a system. If I really? can just give me half a minute or less, I have her book, uh, Dennis Meadows. This one's from Dennis. Uh, so, the uh, yes. system thinking playbook. Right. And Donella Meadows was one of the original authors of the Club of Rome report, um, the, or the original one that um, first pointed out the systemic problem of, um, of uh, climate change and all of these. Limits to um, growth. Yeah, limits to growth, right, thanks. Um, yeah, Michael's a member of the uh, Club of Rome, so currently. Um, and Donella and Dennis, I think, were collaborators on that, so as meadows and meadows. <laughs> yeah, uh, she's passed away, unfortunately. But um, um, one final question from Jorge. Are you still here, Jorge? Yeah, hello. Hi, want to ask? Yeah, sure. Want to ask your question? Yeah. Yes, sure. Well, I, I was wondering um, what, what are your thoughts on, on the research that is performed at the boundary of uh, base of the pyramid research and and sustainability from the system perspective. What are your thoughts on that? Because most of the research at the BOP was mostly focused from the social perspective and the environmental issues that are also critical have not been addressed yet. So if you have any ideas or what are your thoughts on that, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Jorge. Uh, you know, a lot of the base of the pyramid research that is called base of the pyramid research has not been very successful in the top tier journals. And I think it's partly because it hasn't met the hurdle of rigor. And so there's various reasons for it. I don't know exactly why, but it just hasn't had the play that it should. Having said that, I do think that there's a lot of research that is being published in, um, in these uh, developing world contexts that is published. And so you, can you call it the base of the pyramid I do think that they are base of the pyramid work. Uh, and so whether it's social entrepreneurship or social enterprise, whatever, um, there's, there's work that's been done in the, I don't know, in, in contexts that just don't have as much resources. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question, Jorge. I think stuff that's called BOP has had a harder ride though. Jorge, do you no, want to ask more? If I, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Uh, no, actually, I appreciate the, your answer. Uh, you, I think you, you have answered my, my question, and, and I do agree. I mean, I, there is a disconnection between what economists, and, for example, Esther Duflo has done in, in terms of uh, what, what type of enterprises or what type of organizing initiatives can be done to uh, alleviate poverty in, in, in depressed areas. And, and, well, that's actually my challenge right now, I'm trying to apply all these system perspectives that you have written about in terms of sustainability in the context of the bottom of the pyramid. And one of my challenges right now is that uh, the environmental aspects that are, that, that are also related to the, the social issues are not very well connected, that mainly because the system approach has not been considered. So yeah, that, I think you, you did answer my question, thanks. I know we're running short of time. I'll make this comment very brief. Um, the, we are hungry for base of the pyramid systems thinking, and it's there. Uh, people at the base of the pyramid often see the systems and their connection to the natural systems. 
we just don't have good research that's being submitted in that. And I don't know where you are in your career, Jorge, but um, if you find it challenging to make sense of that ambiguity or complexity or whatever that you're dealing with, mint, uh, partner with a senior scholar that's done it because like I say, this is the work that needs to be published. And it's, sometimes it's just a matter of craftsmanship and knowing how to, how to express yourself in a way that's palatable to the better journals. Okay. So Tima, I want to really thank you for your um, willingness to engage with us in this important way and really, um, and thank you to all of the participants for sticking with us. Um, there were over 120 people at one point, so, um, which is a pretty big number. Um, and um, Tima, I just want to end, ask you to end if you have any words of wisdom for people to share with us as, as a final comment. I don't know if I have any more words of wisdom, uh, Sandra. I do want to just, uh, I guess maybe the one thing is this, these issues are more important and more urgent than we have ever anticipated. And, uh, you know, when you hear about insects potentially declining at a rate of two and a half percent per year, when you hear about climate change accelerating so that 11 years from now it will be one and a half degrees, when you hear about species extinction, wildlife extinction, all of these things mean that we will never reach this notion of intergenerational, intragenerational equity. So let's pursue that endeavor. And as I said earlier, cast a spotlight. What we're doing is important. We have a responsibility to do good work. I just want to end then on thanking you, Sandra, especially, but then also the other organizers and in, in helping to make this happen. So David, Michael, and Erica, especially. Thank you, Tima. Thank you, everyone. Um, see you next time. Bye.